check here. You remember to Oh, are we in the same separation? Oh, wait, no, you're TAing separation. Oh, sorry. Cool. What year are you in? Okay. Well, that's for the very end, then. Yeah. <laughs> Our class is going. Too bad yet. Chicken Monday. My research for the semester on Monday. Yeah. You want my class here? Now that's good. Yeah, Two classes in one term. Two classes. Two classes. Yep. Remember, class is kind of like, I guess, like giving a church talk every 300 weeks, right? You know, like, <laughs> work it takes to prepare a lesson for church. Yeah. So I got to sit down and Read all this stuff and read all this stuff that it references all this stuff. And then you gotta figure it out and you write it down. And anyway, and then I have to do your homework too. And it's so, but after the first time, then the other problem is like, so then in the second time you teach your class, you, you, um, you want to change it all because you did what someone else did the first time. You're like, Why am I teach it not there? I should teach this here. And you want to use better examples or more things. And so the second time it takes almost as much time as the first time to be very good. By the third time, you're like kind of honing it. And then I was like, oh, fluid is three times. And they're like, all right, you lost. I'm like, no, <laughs> I want three, four more years of fluid. I don't want to. When you're a new professor, they want to make you teach a uh, breadth of classes, I guess, because they want to figure out if you're too stupid to do one or too mean to do another, right? So, are you too stupid to teach a graduate class and do the hard stuff? Or are you too mean and uncaring to the undergrads? It's easy that you can't figure out how to talk to them and be nice. So, uh, that's me. I'm too mean to the sophomores. Oh, come on. Yeah, I throw candy at them. I, I, if I can't be inherently likable, I just turn to Greg. That's my, that's my plan. <laughs> They're like, we'll do the right? Right. Like, do I get a volunteer for a prayer? To start our class off today. I'll jump at once. And Mark, I guess it's Mark and Mark and Mark. I went back to Mark. Can you hear me while we're finishing here? This time that we have to meet together and sort of study and learn this material, can you please bless that? It's your name, because it was your name, so I can learn these things. Amen. Okay. Okay, so some quick things of business. Um, I take it you saw my email about the release form. I haven't checked if you've done that yet or not. For those of you that have, thank you. If you haven't, just go give that a quick thing. That way I can post the videos on YouTube. If you're not okay with it, we'll just post them privately and we'll send you these. But I think it would be nicer to have them on the website there. So that's all right. If you um, will do that. Um, but please be honest in your assessment there. It makes you uncomfortable if your voice is on the internet. Let me know. Um, homework. Uh, so you have a homework assignment due Wednesday um, in class, right? Class time. I think that's where the homework will close. Um, depending on where we get today, I may take 
one or two of the problems that were for chapter 19 or chapter 3 yet and move them to the next week's assignment to one or two. So just watch for that. Um, so I think that, so as I'm trying to go through the schedule and as if we get a little behind, that'll just be my plan. So if, you, if there's a horse, I'll, I'll try and make sure the problems are there don't get deleted forever so that you feel like you waste your life, right? But if you don't get to one and you did it, it's okay, it'll be for the next week, okay? So I'll try and do my best. And I know I'm not trying to stress you out. I know you work hard, you need deadlines and everything, and you have to make your schedule. So I'll try and not do that as much as possible. But for right now, we're about half a lecture behind. And so uh, just the where we, you know, as you can see, we're doing like the last half of lecture three today. We probably won't finish lecture three today if I had to guess. The stuff that Bill covers is a lot. Um, from his schedule, and I'm kind of like scratching my head sometimes how he did this. But I remember when I subbed for him, I, I did a lecture for him last year, I had the same problem trying to get through all the material. And I remember asking the students in the class, and they were like, Oh, he just goes through it super fast. So, anyway, I have a probably a slower lecture style than he does. So, maybe I'll have to start. We'll just drop some of the subjects at the end that are kind of these throw in subjects, and we might push the exam back into your system and see what happens. So, um, if that's bugging you, it's okay. Send me an email and we can talk about it. I'm just doing my best to keep up. I'm busy too on this stuff. I'm reading DSL like you are and, and trying to figure it all out. So, hopefully, you're learning. So, um, today we're going to continue on. Oh, I should stop. Are there any other questions? For me, before I launch into this, about the mechanics of the class, everything going okay? Okay, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen any of your office hours, so I assume either the homework's easier done to start it. Generally, I would advise you to start the homework before the last day of, you know, there's stuff from, usually you can tell right what chapters are on. I try and get the chapters that are associated with the reading, and those, once we've done that lecture, Right, then the homework that's associated with that chapter you should be able to do. So um, you certainly should be able to do the ones from chapter one. Although we're going to talk a little bit about transport properties today, that's so, um, something. Anyway, hopefully you've at least looked at the homework and tried some of the problems. Um, I guess one more thing. Uh, so I have on the course website a uh, link to a Google form. And I did this in my fluids class that you can include with me. Where you can ask me a question. So, this is my attempt to bring some gospel insight and/or professional career advice into the class. And so, if, I'll try and take some time on Fridays. So I'll start next Friday. So if you have a question, you know about whatever it is, personal question, career question, gospel question, ask away. Okay, um, I'll check those out, and I'll try and have a little fun. Uh, on Friday to share with you guys. All right? So uh, please do that. Um, I'm going to try hard to answer those questions. Okay. So what have we been doing? So we were in energy and conductivity. So we start out, uh, we talked about momentum, transport, and viscosity. And then we saw that energy constituent of log is analogous to the momentum constituent of log, and it was four days log. And we went through a little parallel plate heating uh, thought experiment. And then we wrote down a general expression, which was relatively easy because it was just a vector of flux. And then we talked about a granular number, which came from a thermal diffusivity and the uh, uh, kinematic viscosity the ratio of those. Then we wrote down the total energy flux, which we got from the work and the heat and then the convected uh, energy in and out. Then we have a total flux for that. And so now we want to take a couple minutes and talk about transport properties. So we didn't do that for viscosity. We're going to talk about viscosity and uh, uh, thermal diffusivity here, uh, both together. And we're going to talk just a little bit about um, the properties of viscosity and thermal conductivity. So the first thing I want to do is just get some order of magnitude. Estimates. And so I'm going to write viscosity here in centipoids and the thermal conductivity here in watts per meter Kelvin. 
And this is just to sort of help us see, like I'm a, I'm a theoretician, so to me, the exact values of properties are really kind of boring. I really don't care if it's 1.78 or 1.43, okay? But if it's one or 100, 0.01, that matters for physical intuition, and that, you know, that, that matters to me. So, um, so here in viscosity, just to kind of remind us, only one thing in here. Air has a viscosity of Reynolds. In the book, it listed as 0.01813. That's a lot of decimals of precision. Um, so this is a gas, right? Air is a gas. And this was at, I think all of these values for the viscosity here were at, I'll just put a little star here, we're at 20 degrees Celsius at a warm atmosphere. Okay. If you want, I guess transport properties are hard. Transport properties are a little harder to find um, than like thermodynamic properties, but uh, viscosities are relatively easy. Um, I don't have a great source for it. I guess it's probably, besides your book, I would maybe go to NIST. Have you tried to look up viscosity before? Jimmy's like, no. I don't have a problem sleeping with the tree. Okay. Um, water um, is 1.0019. Okay. So air is. 10 to minus 2, water is order 1, sum of choice. And then it's something here like glycerol, that is 934. Okay, that's around 10 to the 3. So that gives you some idea of the range. So we have liquids up here, right? We have water is a not very viscous liquid, and glycerol is a pretty viscous liquid. Okay, and so that's kind of the order of magnitude on those guys. Um, when we think about thermal conductivities, have something like a gas like oxygen. I guess these were this is the gas slide. Could you slide me that um that physics here? Thank you. My brain stopped working. So it works all the years. Um so oxygen has 0.02657 in the book. This one was at 312 down the one atmosphere. Um, water, so I think saturated liquid water. So these are liquids here. This one was 0.689. This is also a premier Kelvin, whatever the saturation pressure was. And copper, so this one's a solid. Copper is 384.1. At the very specific temperature, so only one point two. Oh, I assume there's lots of information on metals. So it just sort of gives you an order magnitude, right? So here, uh, thermal conductivity and the viscosity are order one for liquids. They're order ten to the minus two for gases. Okay, they're obviously it's all it doesn't have a viscosity, right? That we have to talk about the elastic properties of solid. But for thermal conductivity, we've got something up in the hundreds of thousands. So it really turned out there's more. Okay. If we had some of we got some loss. Um, so that's just a quick sort of gut feeling. And I think you should have those kind of intuitions when you look at this. Um, uh, you know, it would be good to kind of remember those sort of magnitudes. So then in the book, they talk about um, they do this corresponding state plot. And we'll talk about corresponding states in a minute, but it's useful as a first at first blush to get a sense of the temperature and pressure dependence of uh, viscosity and thermal conductivity. So I'm going to do a bad job of sketching the corresponding states plots because it'll take longer to put them up on the screen. But this one was the viscosity divided by the critical viscosity divided by the temperature. This one, or as a function of temperature, this one also a function of temperature. And this thermal conductivity here. And this one had a line sort of like this. And then it had something that came down and sort of went like this. Okay, these curves. And um, these are isobars. Oops. So they are uh, constant pressure. And pressure is increasing this way. And um, this is a two-phase region over here. 
This is the liquid region up here. The quid. This is the gas region up here. Okay. And then the thermal conductivities look kind of similar, but not quite the same. It sort of has more of an envelope. And then these come like this. They sort of come out. But there is this, there isn't a limiting pressure in the same way. So again, these are our isobars. And this is uh, liquid up here, gas down here. I'll move out there in just a second. Two phase region here. Okay, so this is the, uh, and then again, pressure is increasing this way. So pressure goes up that way. Okay, well, let's just sketch that a lot of time. So if you think about this, this is telling you what's going on as a function of temperature, as a function of temperature and pressure for viscosity. So the first thing you see here is that liquids, as you increase temperature, the viscosity goes down. Okay, but gases, the viscosity goes up. So we could say, let's see how I'm going to make this table in my book. Pretty much, I've got a gas here and a liquid here. And I say as the temperature increases, then the pressure increases. What happens? Okay, so for the gas. Viscosity goes up, and for the liquid, viscosity goes down. The viscosity goes down for a little bit, probably intuitive to you. And then you cooked before, and you've seen things get runnier, right? Like oil, when you heat it, right? You put it in, it's pretty viscous, and then you heat it in your pan, right? It gets runnier. Okay? Gases are the opposite. For pressure, um, as pressure is increasing, the viscosity is increasing. Uh, for both, right? Is that not the same? That says it's the same. Oh, in the gas phase, there's this limit here, right? So your gas, gas, gas here. And so it's really insensitive, you know, unlike this one here, right? Whereas I'm in a gas and I'm increasing pressure. Increasing. Here, the pressure is, or the pressure is, uh, or the viscosity is pretty constant for the gas phase. So that's this one. So mu and a gas is pretty much constant. Okay, and new for the liquid is increasing as pressure increases. Okay, it's not exactly constant, but it's you know, sort of it, it's relatively the same. Okay, um, and then we can do the same thing for thermal conductivity, and thermal conductivity follows um, the same trends except this pressure one, right? Because that's the difference between these sort of curves here and this collapsed curve here. So the thermal conductivity goes up. For gas at temperature, and it goes down uh, for a liquid, okay? And then over here, the, uh, the thermal conductivity goes up as a function of pressure, and up for a liquid also as a function of pressure, okay? So that's, there, there's no, like, I haven't told you like molecular mechanisms, I haven't told you the, like, why this is the case. This is just, you know, observing, and plotting data, you know, and then correlating it together using a course box. All right. So I see you have kind of a squinty eye. So you have a question, problem. I get the temperature of the gas and the viscosity, but the pressure on the liquid, since most liquids are compressible, something like that would change our energy with the viscosity. But with the gas, the same way the temperature, you're increasing the collisions. So with the increased pressure, you're increasing the collisions. So you gotta be a little careful. So you're so um so one of the things is you're thinking about incompressibility and all this kind of stuff, but that's not the same thing as viscosity, right? You're thinking about how does density change as a function of pressure. That's what incompressibility is talking about, right? So viscosity is a different piece, it's not a it's not an equilibrium property of the fluid. It doesn't have, you know, it, it has to do with, like, the, there's these theories that we'll, we'll talk about here in just a second, right? So, um, you know, in a in a gas, you're looking at the mean free path between molecules that are colliding with each other, okay? And so you have to think about statistical mechanics when you start to think about a theory for the for the transport properties. And not only just statistical mechanics, but think about non-equilibrium behavior. And so, some of the reasoning you're sort of uh, going down that path 
I'm not comfortable like saying, you know, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like this is incompressible. So I think you're trying to take an intuition from your previous fluids knowledge and apply it here, but I don't think that that translates. Does that make sense? So um, and hopefully we'll uh, answer some of those questions as we go on. But if we don't, stop me and we can see if we can figure it out. Okay. Other questions, other great questions. All right, so let's let's dive into this a little bit then. So there are at least four ways that I know that you can obtain these transport properties. Okay, and I will just uh, list them. This isn't meant to be like logically complete. This is just my way of breaking it down. Okay, so you can do experiments. Okay, the second is you can use these corresponding states arguments. We'll talk about each of these in a second. I just want to list them up here. The third is you can use what Bird calls kinetic theory. That's um, he calls he has a broader envelope for kinetic theory than the the modern meaning picture, at least in my feeling. So today we would call this uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. theory okay and we call kinetic theory a very specific part of that but bird who was a pioneer in a giant area a lot of people I would decide bird like called kinetic theory all of the people in all my good and statistical mechanics and another one um I will put up here the simulation okay so we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about each of these um, and try to get some Okay, so I'm going to come back over here. So I'm just going to All right, so first one experiment. I have relatively little to say about this. It's not, this, this doesn't talk about this in the book. I'm not an experimentalist, but I do have a rheometer. Yeah, I per purchased one with a clock or so. Um, so uh, you're welcome to follow it if you're nice to it. You're welcome to come measure the viscosity of the liquid on our viscometer and be nice to it. And yeah, maybe Dan will do I don't know. Do you run the, do you run the rheometer? Rheometer. Okay. Yeah. They're fun. They do viscosity, they do viscoelasticity, they get all sorts of fun little things out of it. So uh, there are other things that are tables on places like NIST. I don't know. I don't I don't think Dipper has any transport properties. Yeah. Maybe they do, do they? Viscosity on that. They have viscosity. Yeah. Cool. So there you go. Got Dipper. So uh, you know, I would say uh, you know, there's things like rheometers. Okay, there's Dipper, okay, there's tables, right? And there's other ways of measuring the scouts, so you guys have all your discoveries and different things. I know less about measuring thermal conductivity, um, but I didn't read much about it. So a better mechanical engineering student knows more about measuring thermal conductivity than me. Um, so I forget your name. Can you remind me your name? Zach. Zach. Okay, Zach. Okay, because we have Zach, Zach. I think I know everybody else, right? Andrew, Zach, Zach, Brian, Roya, Mark, Mark, and Daniel, right? Is it Dan or Daniel? Okay, my brother, I have a brother, his name is Daniel, and we don't call him Dan, I'm all the last. Okay, so, okay, corresponding states. So, it's a little windy, my uh, outline experiments. I'll have to, we'll try and make us work on the whole part. Okay, so, Corresponding state is kind of interesting. I got kind of interested in what people about this. So it's always kind of bugged me, corresponding states. So, um, so corresponding states is this postulate that um, you could write down somehow uh, like a thermodynamic uh, equation of state that's universal for everything. Okay. So you can see this if you go back and think about taking thermodynamics. And you remember learning about like the Vanderbilt's equation of state, right? And it applies to everything. There's just a couple of constants that you plug in, and every different 
property is supposed to come out of that. Okay. The problem is, is that it doesn't work. It's not true. Okay. People hoped it would, and it appears to work in certain cases, and but it doesn't really work. Okay. And so these plots here, you know, what they're what they're showing you are for certain cases of certain materials that happen to fall together. And it turns out that there's been some um, people have studied corresponding states enough to understand why it works and doesn't work. So maybe I will say a little bit about that. So I think the takeaway first one here is it's an attempt to make a universal, and I'm going to put this in, in quotes here, equation of state. Okay, you know, or just function, right? Uh, TMD. Because it's not an equation of state for a transport property. All right, an equation of state, that terminology applies to a transport property, but it's analogous to what they're doing here for transport. Okay, uh, you have to make universal equation of state uh, for all, uh, you know, I hope for liquids and gases. Okay, and unfortunately, it doesn't work. Okay, frowning face, it didn't work out. It's a nice idea, but nice to hear you for Can't have it. You can actually read one of those. Okay, um, so why it does work when it does has to do with uh, the following reason. I'm going to write it down and then I'll try to explain it again. Stop. Okay. So um, it works in some cases okay, when the uh, uh, inter I call this the interatomic pair potential, interatomic pair potential has the same form. Okay, um, and so let me explain what that means. So if I have, I'm going to draw this curve here. So hopefully it also helps you with your homework. So this isn't just a random deviation. Okay, so. Um, all atoms have a potential of interaction when they come to the right? And um, these are specific to the electronic properties of the way atoms interact. All right? And so you have to do quantum mechanics to understand this where this curve potential comes from, right? So things that don't react with each other that are monoatomic atoms have a pair potential that looks like this. Okay. This pair potential of this, this one is called a Leonard jump potential. Okay. And that's that's actually one person's name, Leonard Jump. All right, very last name. And what this is telling you is if I have these particles and they're far apart from each other, the potential of that energy between them is zero. They don't interact, right? They're far apart. But as I bring them together, there's an attractive well of value epsilon, you know, or minus epsilon, right? So they attract each other, and they want to sit in that well next to there. And that's usually due to the dipole dipole interactions that cause them to be able to do that. Okay. And then as you try and push them together even more, okay, there's hard core repulsion. So there are electrons and you know, don't want to occupy the same space, okay, due to all exclusion, and they push back on each other, okay, and, and you can't make two atoms to polarize each other, all right? And so this pair potential, every atom, has, you know, if you take two atoms of the same thing, you know, or whatever, and try to do this, you can, in principle, figure out what this is, okay? And this shape is pretty common, okay, because a lot of things have dipole dipole interactions and the core repulsion. And so a lot of monotonic atoms have a shape that looks like this. And when they all have the same shape, 
okay, of this curve. Then corresponding stage works for those compounds. Okay, so that's what I mean by this. So it works when they have the same interatomic privilege. Okay, so if you know, but not everything has the same privilege. Things have hydrogen bond. Things do other weird things, right? When they're in, you know, when they interact, okay. And so they don't all have the same potential. So then, corresponding stage has to optimize. Okay. And so in your book, you've got they do corresponding stage for gases and liquids, and when they when they, they have monatomic gases and liquids like the noble gases or whatever, those work pretty well. But when you start to get more complicated atoms, it doesn't work as good. Okay. And so. You know, the kind of hope with corresponding states is that it's more universal than this. There's some kind of universals, right? They have the exact same functional form. It doesn't have to be the same function because the this sigma, the distance of that, those atoms as they interact, and this well depth, you know, they can be different, right? As long as the dimensionless form is the same, because you can scale by that value. So as long as that's the same, corresponding states work. So, but you know, that's still really pretty long. Does that make sense? All right, so that's corresponding states. Um, so in your book, there's a bunch of like plug in chart problems for calculating transport properties. And I just gave you a few of these, okay, sort of help familiarize us with the transport properties and other things. And one of them are corresponding states problems. And the whole idea of the corresponding state problem is that it's hard to get this critical viscosity or the critical uh, uh, thermal conductivity. They aren't like tabulated. Um, that things are hard to measure at the critical point, so it's hard to just go measure that. So there are some empirical relationships. There's equations that you can use to estimate it. So that's one way to do these problems. So you kind of look it up. You have to find the critical temperature and the critical pressure, which are in tables in your book. Okay. And then you, you, know, you go look those up. And then you have to use the empirical equation to calculate the critical viscosity. You plug that all in and you read off the curve, you know, where from the temperature and pressure. What, the, what this ratio is multiplied by the critical viscosity you have discussed. Okay. Or if they don't give you an empirical relationship, what you can do is you can take a viscosity you know already of the same uh, material, right? So, or the different material that's in the same class. So, you know, so say they give you xenon's viscosity, okay, you're trying to find helium. You can take the viscosity of xenon at the temperature and pressure, go find it on the fly, right? And then that can tell you where what this is. Now you know mu, and you can calculate mu of c. Does that make sense? So the, the idea is it's hard to get this guy. Okay, so on your homework, that's the trick to do these problems. Is the trick is trying to get the critical viscosity, the critical thermal conductivity, and using the plot to get this quantity somehow. Okay, and then either knowing the denominator or knowing the denominator. Okay, you guys are professional students now, so I trust that I don't need to like do this out step by step as an example. You guys can figure out the problems. Okay, but if you have questions, please leave them now. Okay, I'm not trying to say if you get stuck, you should have us. But that's what I'm going to say about corresponding states. That's convenient. I left that up there. I don't want to see. All right, so. The next one is kinetic theory. Okay, so um, kinetic theory is basically um, a completely different subject than this course. Okay, um, it is non equilibrium statistical. Okay, so you know if you're doing like the SAT thing, kinetic theory is to this class what statistical mechanics is to thermo. Okay, so in thermo, you know, in thermo you learn about the you know how free energies mixing, you know, uh, phase behavior. Okay, in statistical mechanics you learn how do I connect that to atoms and molecules. Right. So if I want to know how to get the density, right, or if I want to know how to know when phase behavior happens, but I want to predict that for molecule properties, 
molecular properties rather than from just classical thermodynamics, how do I do that? Okay. So just like this class is like a step harder, I think, than thermal, right? You take thermal and then take it out of equilibrium. Non equilibrium statistical mechanics is like takes step back and pushes it out of equilibrium and it's yet harder. So the theories here, it's not like we have this grand formalism like we have in transport or, or thermodynamics. You just do everything. There are things we know about static. So we know the like basic equations, and we just can't solve it. Okay. So people make lots of approximations and come up with stuff. Okay. And so there's two I'm gonna two sort of classes I'm gonna highlight here. So one I'm gonna uh, highlight is the gases. Okay. And gases, it turns out we can do pretty good because they're not very dense. And so the whole, one of the hard things about the, these equations for stat you know, about them is that you can calculate something for a single atom all along. So, you know, if you have 10 to the 23 of them, if you have to start taking into account their interactions with each other, it gets hard. Okay. And it turns out you can rewrite the equations as um, a single atom and then pairs of atoms and then triplet hit collisions, et cetera, et cetera. And that allows you to make some progress. It's kind of like a Taylor series, it's called cluster expansion. Um, and so for gases, you can do some basic solutions here um, because if they're dilute enough, it's okay, it works out. So um, there are two theories that the book talks about, and I'm not going to go into them in detail, but one is uh, Maxwell Holston. Okay. And this is the one that they keep they explain again and again and again with the mean free path idea. Okay. And the basic idea here is these are hard sphere models. Okay. So you're assuming that your atoms are just billiard balls. Okay. That have a certain diameter and they collide in space. Okay. And they have this idea of what's called a mean free path, which is basically how long atoms in a gas, you know, what's the average. Distance, right? Uh, is it before they collide with each other? So it's how long it can travel before it loses. Okay. And they use that idea to come up with these equations. So the viscosity is 2 over 3, three pi. Oh, goodness, right? It turns out I can always do it. 1 over 10 pi over 5 and 32. Oh, I've got a basketball. So. Only one last one says so okay, so we kind of get to these. Okay, so these here, I'm just going to write these equations up there in your book. I am Boltzmann and the temperature. And that's my F. Okay, they look very similar for the viscosity and the thermal conductivity. You guys, all they have to do with are these hard spheres colliding into each other. Okay. And so the, the theories are very similar. So you can go read about them more. I, I'm not going to test you on the details of this, okay? But if you want to know more about these kind of theories, you can try and go at it. Um, one of the things you see out of this is that the viscosity and the thermal conductivity go like the spread of the temperature. So that goes with our intuition from before. And the book talks about how that's kind of that's close ish. It's not exactly right, but it's a pretty good thing. This D here is the this is the diameter of the sphere. Um, and this is the mass. Um, anything else I'm missing? T is temperature. Uh, KB is Boltzmann's constant. So uh, you guys know Boltzmann's constant, right? You guys know that R is equal to KB times Avogadro's number. You know this? Okay. All right. Um, I like KB more because I do spend that all the time. So I just want to run away from the bottom of all the Okay. So the first one is Maxwell Boltzmann. Okay. And then there's this more complicated theory by Chapman and Enskog. That's like the gold standard for making adjustments. Yeah. That. Does that mean K equals U times P capacity? K equals U times the heat Does it exactly the same? Yeah, in the estimate, yes. In this thing, I didn't make a mistake. Yep. Yep. 
Okay, and so there's a very similar. Okay, so so this is like a they use a very similar process that Maxwell Boltzmann does. Okay, but in Maxwell Boltzmann, because of these hard term models, you can make these simplifications and make these arguments that you can sort of follow. But there's a deeper way of doing it that has all these nasty equations. And Chapman and Enstall, they don't assume hard spheres, they assume a Leonard Jones dimension. Okay, so they use, so they assume Leonard Jones. Okay, and so when they assume Leonard Jones, that makes it harder. Okay, a hard sphere potential, maybe just to show you, a hard sphere potential looks like this. Like this. Okay. Or that's your diameter. So it's zero and then it's infinite, okay, at the hard diameter. So it turns out this is actually easy to deal with. You might think infinity is hard, but it turns out you can break the integrals up, which have lots of integrals to do this. And you have zeros, okay, which makes your life easy. And then you only have to you can deal with collisions in a different way because you don't have to deal with the collisions where you've got this whole continuous function is not going to be exponential. Okay, so um, they have an estimate here, new, let's call it pi over 16, pi m dt, the root, pi sigma squared, okay, and then this omega, okay? So now this looks a lot like this, okay? The functional form is quite similar, right? Except there's a sigma here. This sigma is this, Part of the Leonard Jones potential. Okay. And um, there's a different pre factor out front. Okay. And then there's this thing down here, which is called a collision interval. Okay. And it basically has to do with integrals of these two beads and come together and how do I integrate this potential? And it's just some function. Okay. So this is tabulated in your book. Okay, and these are also in tables. Okay, so the epsilons and sigmas for different uh, for different uh, atoms are in your book. So when you do these problems, okay, you just you need to go look up in the tables these things. Okay, the collision interval is a tabulated thing. Okay, and I might even I think I remember looking at appendix where it is, and they might have like a a uh, fit like to the collision interval if you want to get all the fancy instead of just like linear means interpolating you want to code it up in Python or something and like pull out a value from the fit you know knock yourself out that's the book um the one for the thermal conductivity is similar okay it has uh pi and Boltzmann temperature square root Pi sigma squared, and then a collision interval C sub B. Okay, so similar, different coefficient out front. Okay, and this, I think the difference in the collision interval, uh, I should probably remember that. So, uh, look it up. But I can't remember if it's two different tabulated things, but it just has to do with how you scale the piece. Okay, so, and then they have things like Mixing rules, mixtures, and um, these are only good for monatomic gases, right? As we can kind of see. So we have like, of course, like eight states, which is good for monatomic gases. We have this, which is good for, I guess, it's also good for monatomic All right, we'll just hit um, liquids on that simulation for a minute. And then I'll, right, looks like we won't get to most of the confusion. Okay, liquids. Okay. So in all the, in, if you notice, like Bert has like each in the book, right? Everything's divided into like eight chapters, and they all mirror each other, right? And the sections, as much as I can, also mirror each other. So the part for viscosity is like the part for thermal conductivity, like that part for for the fusivity. So they have this part on kinetic theory and corresponding states and all of that. And then the part for liquids, they're always kind of like, and here's a bunch of made up theories that aren't very good for liquids, but it's the best we have. And that's kind of the case here, okay? So they have two that they list. One is 
Irene's theory, okay, um, which is by not uh, Irene, if you're thinking of probably, okay, Henry Irene, um, famous Mormon scientist. And I guess I'm not supposed to say a famous scientist, but which would be interesting to write these things. Um, and another one by a guy named Bridgman, okay. And the key idea in Irene's theory was like what he did with. Uh, reaction kinetics is there's a transition state for you. So there's basically has this idea of hopping between vacant sites and liquid. So a liquid is actually a really crowded environment with all these molecules bumping up against each other. And his idea was in order to have transport, you have to have an open space over there, and there's some barrier to moving that spot. Okay. And the rate is going to be proportional to the time it takes you to get over that barrier. So there's thermal energy around, there's some probability of hopping. And that's how we came down with that idea. And so the formula here is Avogadro's number times Planck's constant. And I don't know why Planck's constant in here, but apparently it is. Um, 3.8 times the boiling temperature divided by the temperature. Okay. So this is boiling temperature here. And this uses like a bunch of approximations. So it's really super, this is the volume. This is Planck's constant and Avogadro's number. Okay. Uh, Bridgman's theory had to do with taking a lattice of hard particles and using the idea that the speed of sound propagates through, and that has to do with density waves. And I don't understand this Bridgman's theory, so maybe one of you can explain it to me. But I know it's, it has to do with the lattice and the speed of sound. That's what I remember. So that's a terrible explanation. If you can put that on your, like on my back of the evaluation. Dr. Tree, besides being a big nerd, did not understand the things very well. So like, that's a real thing. Okay. And this one, oh, this one, oh, that's why it's about the uh, lattice. Okay. So this is related to the thermal conductivity. So that's what I was saying. This one's for viscosity. This one's for thermal conductivity. That's the important part. I just forgot that. That's why it has to do that. And I Okay, so in thermal conductivity, right, um, you're thinking about phonons, last vibration, that's one way you can uh, calculate thermal conductivity. So that does have to do with density waves. Maybe that makes more sense to you. That makes more sense to me. MA over V. It looks, it has the same molar volume in it. Uh, and then this is uh, Oltzman's constant, and this is the speed of sound. Okay, and you can find the speed of sound for various materials. And one way to do it is by finding the oh, that's another one. Oh, that's full thermal compressibility, which is related to this point. So this is the speed of sound square root of CP, CP, CP over CV. This is the derivative of the pressure with respect to density. I hate this writing these derivatives. You've got curly D's and then P's and then rows. Okay, so that's related to isothermal compressibility. It isn't exactly, but it's isothermal compressibility is related to that. Like, okay, there's there's a row and a complexity. Okay, and then they talk a lot. He's got all these other things about. Solids and composites, and suspension of emulsions, and all that kind So there's these two theories. This one has to do with hopping. Okay. This was the transition state hopping idea. Okay. And then this one was the lattice model of the speed of Right? This thing over there. Okay. So the last thing is simulations, which we do. Yes, far away. Let's say for 2.3. Yes, it does. We apologize. And the gate in the end is going to be a unit on the right side, but it's more. Oh, that's 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 called an isothermal. That's just the that's isothermal. Sorry about that. Compressibility. That's a thermodynamic property you can look up for something. Right? It has to do with how the the density of the material changes as a function of pressure, which is 
Oh, this is like upside down. This right. This is saying how does pressure change the density? Then it says how does density change the pressure? Okay, so simulations. Okay, I'll kind of say the same thing I said with experiments. So simulations are kind of like experiments in that um, you want to calculate the property. You have to do some equipment. It takes a long time, and so if you want to do that, I have a big computer. I have access to the computers. I know how to do some of these calculations. They're also nice. Happily, sure to do that. I'm not the best person for predicting transport properties in the department. Dr. Nance does this. I don't think there are many else to do this. But right now, I think uh, I'm sure he's in Addison. Addison's doing this cost of the problem. No, no, it's, it's uh, the other one. I am. One of the NASA students is working on calculating this cost of the problem. Okay, so if you want them to calculate some for you, you know all about it. I can point you from there. So let's go and then here. Yeah. So, uh, but in principle, the nice thing about simulation, okay, is you can do any pair of potential. That's the kind of idea, okay. All right, so not really any many, but you can do any, like, you know, many, many more pair of potentials, okay, and you can do uh, a lot more dense, right? So, more dense, you can do liquids, for instance, quite easily, uh, relative to what you can do in the group, okay? So, um, <clears throat> that's where we're going to end. We'll do lecture three, sorry, next time. So, I will take all the problems from chapter 19, which are the ones for diffusivity, and we'll move those to the next one, okay? So, I just do all the problems for uh, the other chapters. I will update the, the homework on the website um, after the class. So, all right, that was a long slide through transport properties. Yes. Just like notation, but